ता पिता बंदुश्च सखा My most loving salutations at the divine lotus feet of Sai, who is my mother, who is my father, who is the basis of all knowledge, and my loving salutations to Sai, who is in each and every one of your hearts, shining brightly and lovingly. I am so happy to be here with all of you today and to share Swami's love. The more we share His love, the more His love grows and grows in our own hearts and all around us. When Angelica was singing her bhajan, Sai Ram Bhagwan, it triggered a lot of memories for me and that was followed by your bhajan, I love you Lord. When God incarnates on earth, and when he assumes a physical form, they say two things happen, amongst many other things. One, we get to not only see, but also experience God's love. The second, because we have been touched by His love, God gets to experience our love for Him. And the story that comes to my mind when I heard Angelica's song, because there's a sentence that says, you know, have, we are crying out, humanity is crying out to you, can you not hear us? So this incident happened in late 70s or early 80s in Bangalore, there was a young mother and she had twin boys. And it so happened that, you know, India is used to um, interesting political situations and they had a curfew going on and these twin boys were very young and um, the mother had run out of food for the babies. She had run out of the formula. So there was no way she could feed these young babies and um, she was very desperate. And her husband was very particular that they would not go out to the black market and try to get food for these babies because he felt like that was not something Swami would approve to go and bribe somebody and procure food for the children. And he said, well, th these are Swami's children, so Swami is supposed to protect them. Swami is supposed to provide food for them. And the mother got very frustrated and she felt like, I'm sure some of you might have felt, oh, these men are always like this, straight as an arrow. They don't understand. These children don't have food and they have to be fed. So she went straight to the altar room. She sat down in front of Swami and she gave Swami a piece of her mind. And she said, I am sure you're standing in the veranda and spending all your time with the students, happily chatting away with them. And here my children, pardon me, your children don't have food. What are you going to do? What kind of a God are you? And she cried her heart out. 
So the husband felt a little bit guilty and he was like, well, let me at least try. So he goes across town to a place that's, um, that he heard was still open and was selling uh, formula. And he makes a trek out there and by the time he gets to the other side of the town, the last carton of milk powder was sold. So he was returning home empty-handed. And as he was coming back, he was feeling very distraught. He was like, you know, number one, he didn't want to face his wife again. Number two, his children don't have food at all. So he was in a scooter and he was by a traffic light. And as he was waiting there, uh, because the signal had, um, had been read, there was, a, there was an auto rickshaw, you know, the three-wheeler auto rickshaw, pulled up by the side. And the old man from the auto rickshaw kind of tries to get his attention. And the father is ignoring him, but somehow the old man from the auto rickshaw gets his attention, and he shows a piece of paper, and he says, do you know where this address is? And so by the time the light had changed, so the cop was yelling at them and they had to move, so they crossed the intersection and they pulled over to a side and then he reads the address on the paper and it turns out that it is his address. And he's all curious and he says, uh, this, is, this is my name and this is my address, can you please tell me why? Um, you're going there because I don't recognize you. So the old man says, well, you know, I have a parcel for you. I was supposed to deliver it. And uh, I'm so happy I met you on the way. So here you go. Um, this is yours and please sign your name here. And he signed his name on a piece of paper and the old man left. And he had this huge carton that he was trying to balance on the back of his scooter. And he goes home goes inside and then he asks his wife, did you, were you expecting a parcel? You know, did somebody call and say that they were going to be sending something? And the wife says, no, you know, I, I'm not expecting anything. Um, I don't think my parents said that they were going to send anything for us. But what is it inside the box? Uh, did you check it? And the father says, no, I haven't checked it yet. And then they unwrap the box and there's this huge carton and it's filled with milk cartons, food for the baby. And the mother is just shocked. The father is also shocked. Here this morning, a few hours ago, they were complaining. Um, she was yelling at Swami. Um, she was feeling so bad that, you know, her children didn't have any food. And a few hours later, there was this huge carton filled with food for the babies. Time goes by, the mother goes to Puttaparthi with her children. She's sitting in darshan line and Swami comes for darshan and uh, the mother is very happy. She has a very good darshan of Swami. Swami walks past her and just stops after he crosses her, turns around, looks at her and says, did you get food for the baby? And then it hit the mother, oh my gosh. I didn't even remember to thank Swami. And then it turns out that the family was called inside for the interview. So when they were called inside for the interview, you know, the mother has an opportunity to thank Swami. And this is, this is the message that I wanted to share with you. You know, Swami said to the mother, you were sitting there in the altar room complaining, saying that, you know, I must most probably be chatting away. Uh, with the students, I might not be able to hear your prayers coming back to the bhajan. I might not be able to hear your prayers because I'm so focused on the students. But let me tell you something. I can hear even the footsteps of an ant. I can hear even the footsteps of an ant. So when you sing Sai Ram Bhagwan, you know, Swami is saying, even an ant, 
And I shouldn't be saying even an ant. Ant has a lot of lessons, a lot of messages for us. But even an ant that we cannot hear, God can hear even the footsteps of an ant. Will he not hear your prayers? Of course he will. Sai Ram Bhagawan. The other story that I wanted to share, which I was reminded by your bhajan, I love you Lord, was this is a recent event that happened when Swami was in the hospital. You know, you might have heard about the different projects that um, Swami has done, you know, the hospital, the educational institution, the water projects. So this, this happened early, early May, uh, April, when Swami had just uh, been admitted to the hospital. Swami had provided drinking water to a city called Madras, that is in Tamil Nadu. And they had been suffering from acute water shortage. And I'm from Madras and I, I know, I experienced the water shortage. Here when we open the tap, water flows out of it. I, I have lived in Madras where when we opened the tap, there was no water that would come out of the tap. So it, it was very, very bad situation. And now because of Swami's water project, water reaches for more than 14 million residents of the city of Madras. So it, it has done, uh, it has had a very, very tremendous impact, not only for the citizens of Madras, but also those who live in the neighboring towns because the water flows from a different source. So all the towns and villages that are by the canals are benefited by the water supply. So this office bearer from the organization um, who lived on the outskirts of the city, he was having chai at a roadside tea stall and he was very familiar with the local people there. So as he was drinking his cup of chai, a group of villagers had approached him and they said, uh, sir, we heard you know, Sai Baba has been admitted uh, to the hospital. Um, do you have any news about him? And um, the office bearer explained that Swami was in the hospital and um, gave a most recent update to these villagers. And um, the villagers were feeling very, very sad. And they said, sir, you know, Baba has done so much for us. So much for us. He is." You know, our lives have changed because of this water project. We are all so happy now. What is it that we can do? And one by one, they opened their wallets. These are simple villages, you know, just, just the purity of their heart, their innocence. They open their wallets up, they pull all the money together, and they give it to this office bearer, and they say, can you please make sure Baba gets the best treatment on this planet because he has done so much for us. And one gentleman stepped forward and he said, Sir, because of Baba, my family is alive today. You said that his liver was not functioning. Well, his kidneys are failing. If you would like, I will be happy to go to Puttaparthi. I will be happy to donate my kidney, to donate my liver, if that is going to make Baba all right. The sweet innocence. He has never seen Swami in his life. He has never read any books, any discourses. Um, he has not joined any center. He has not sung any bhajans. He has not learned the Vedas but he just loves Swami because of what Swami's love has done for him. So this is, this is our privilege, our good fortune that we have had that we could experience and continue to experience. Because Ben sang, uh, there is no birth, there is no death, there is only Satya Sai, no moon, no earth, there is only Sai. We can continue to experience his love for eternity, as long as we feel him. So he's very much alive in our own hearts. And I kind of felt that way when I went to Puttaparthi in July. I was a little bit apprehensive 
because this was my first trip to Puttaparthi, I was not sure how I would be feeling when I um, went to Kulvanthal. So when I went there and I sat down and I was sharing this with Angelica, I should say that the energy was just incredible, just incredible. I cannot even describe it. You, you sit in the Kulvant Hall and everybody is so focused. It's not like before. Even a year ago when I went to Puttaparthi, when people would come there and you know this is a natural experience that we would have, we would sit in the darshan line, if we are sitting in the token line, the first thing we'll be praying for is, hope I get the first line. And then once you get inside the Kulvant Hall, the thoughts that you're getting is, hope I get a good line so that I am able to see Swami properly. And then as soon as we sit there, these multitude of thoughts go into our head, right? Swami, this is happening at home. Swami, this is happening with my job. Swami, this is happening with my family. Swami, my kids have to get married. Swami, I have to get married. Swami, this is ha has to happen. That is, has to happen. There's so many thoughts that go in our mind. And we sit there and when Swami comes, the thought that comes into our head is, will he not look at us? Will, we, will he not talk to us? So, the focus was on what we could get from Swami. But now when people are seated there, you could just, the energy is so palpable that they feel Swami within them. And all that people want is to experience His love. There are no prayers for any worldly things, just this simple dialogue, heart to heart, love to love as Swami would say. So just the energy is just so incredible and there are no token lines anymore. So there's no rush for darshan. The timings are set so people come in and they're very, very focused and very calm and very peaceful. And I'm sure Nicole would have stories to share as well because she just came back from Puttaparthi. Um, just the energy is so incredible. The youth conference, just to share a few snippets with you, we had more than 400 delegates, more than 400 delegates from 70 countries. And it was kind of like such a cool experience. It felt like a United Nations. Puttaparthi always feels like a United Nations, but this was just um, a super cool version of the United Nations. These young adults, um, youth leaders, basically. So this. The conference that we had back in 2007, uh, it was a World Youth Conference. It was for all the young adults to come and participate. The purpose of this uh, conference was slightly different. Uh, it was for all the youth leaders from, the, from around the world um, to come and participate and engage in meaningful, pur purposeful discussions about how to move the organization forward. So we had um, young adults, like I said, from 70 countries and um, we had a, the conference was over two days and we had speakers in the morning and after the speaker session we broke into our own study circle groups and we had a total of three study circle sessions, two on the first day and one on the second day. And the group studies, so the format was very similar to the world conference from last year. So there would be groups of 20 young adults um, in a circle. And I, I got to admit, generally study circle is not the most popular aspect of a center. We don't get a lot of participation. I mean, we'll, we'll be honest with each other, right? Just how excited these young adults were. It, it, was, it was something to behold. I was like, wow, I've never seen um, even adult study circles, people get so excited about study circles. But here young adults were so excited. Um, some of the groups did a warm-up session. They actually did a physical warm-up so that they will get into, you know, what the young adult call like their zone. You know, you get into your zone um, to be focused and discuss the study circles. There were so many creative aspects of doing a study circle. We had one particular group where the only 
um, response that they would accept from the participant is they would have to act out their answer. So if they had, a, so if you can imagine, not only did they have to think about what they're going to say, they have to act it out, which means that the response had to be very, very straightforward. So it's not beating around the bush at all. So it was just incredible to see the enthusiasm that the young adults had and the energy with which they approached all the topics. So we had three topics. One was divine instruction. So what is it that you know, Swami has guided the youth um, to focus on? The second was divine inspiration. So they, the discussion was surrounded um, based on the words of Swami, what Swami has said specifically for the youth. And the third study circle was um, we are coming up with a proposal to start a young adult apprenticeship program where young adults can become more integrated within the organization. Because this, you know, they always say young adults are the future leaders, but Dr. Goldstein said, well, the future is today, it's not tomorrow. So, you know, the young adults need to be prepared to take a more active role uh, in the process of the organization, the different aspects of the organization. Um, some of the interesting side notes, you could tell it was a young adult conference because on the first day when we had a small break during the study circle, we all got served cakes. So it has to be a youth conference when cake is your, your snack during a study circle. On the second day, we got ice cream as a snack during our study circle break. So it was just kind of like, you know, the entire conference, the flavor was very youngish. It was sweet and very youthful. Um, every single aspect of the conference was planned by the young adults. Every single action item was implemented by the young adults. So for example, the registration process, which started in the month of June, it was coordinated and facilitated by the young adults. Once we got to Puttaparthi, with the registration team, the accommodation team, the hospitality team, where all, all the desks were manned by the young adults, um, setting up chairs in Purna Chandra Auditorium. It was done by young adults. Leading the study circle was done by the young adults. So it was a conference by the young adults for the young adults. And then um, on the first day in the morning, actually the day before the conference, this was on the 12th, 12th morning, just to give you a share how, you know, when your hearts are filled with love for Swami and you're all coming together, any task is possible. You know, they usually pun on the word, they say, you know, whatever is impossible, you should say, I am possible. So that's impossible when you split the words, it becomes I am possible. So on the 12th morning, we were asked to assemble at the North Indian canteen. And this was around 6.30 in the morning. And we had to be in the Darshan grounds by 8 o'clock. So we just had a very small window of time. And we had to pack prasadam, which was going to be distributed in the Sai Kulvant Hall. And do you know how, how many packets? Does anybody want to take a guess? 10,000? 30,000. <laughs> so we had to pack close to 10,000 packets. And we had to do it in less than one hour. So the trays, the sweets were on trays. So we had more than 10,000 pieces of barfi that we had to, and we were given these white um, envelopes. So you had to take the envelope out, open it, put the barfi in, and fold the envelope twice, and then put it in a separate tray. So if you think from picking up the envelope to putting the envelope filled with the barfi on the tray, it almost takes about, if you do it really fast, 30 seconds, right? So we packed almost 10,000 packets. It was done by 60 young adults, ladies, in 40 minutes. In 40 minutes, all the 10,000 packets were packed. And the canteen guy came out and he was just so shocked. He was like, wow, this is like record time. And as we were packing the packets, 
we had this group of uh, young adults from Russia and this was just, it just blew me away. You know, language was a huge issue with them. Even the study circle group, they had a separate group so that they could conduct their study circle in Russian. And here they are, bright and early, all of them wearing saris. And they are singing Sanskrit bhajans. They are singing Sanskrit bhajans. And I'm not a very good singer much better than even how I can pronounce those words. And with such love and devotion for Swami, with such love and devotion. And I'm not trying to say that all of us should be singing Sanskrit bhajans, that's not what I'm trying to say. The point that I want to make is, if Swami was born in Vietnam, and if the bhajans were in Vietnamese, these Russian devotees would learn Vietnamese and sing bhajans because they, are, they would be so in love with Swami. Their love for Swami is just so incredible and I, I heard the story that Swami once said that, you know, the devotees from Russia, you know, Swami always done a, does a pun on words, they are Rasyas. Rasyas means those who enjoy the sweetness. Ras means sweet, Rasya is sweetness. So anybody who enjoys the sweetness of God's love, they are Rasyas. In other words, Russians. And you could feel it. And you know, these young adults, they come from such remote areas, in um, remote places in Russia. And when we were trying to speak with them uh, through an interpreter, we had Vladimir there, a uh, budding young adult. They travel five hours at the very least, either by train or bus, to get to a center or to get to a young adult meeting. They spend five hours just to travel from their home to get to a center or to a young adult meeting. And the way they crave for this satsang, for this, you know, they want to speak with as many devotees as possible. They crave to hear um, stories about Swami. And when they sing bhajans, it's just, you know, it's, it's incredible. I, I don't know how else to uh, describe it. It's just such an incredible experience. And when we were sitting together in the darshan line, I would whip out my Rudram Veda book and I would be looking at the book and chanting the Rudram. They would be sitting next to me and just chanting the Rudram like without a book. I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, they were an inspiration for me. I was, that was one of the beautiful things during this young adult conference that everybody's heart was so open. They were so joyful. They were, you know, everybody was so open to being inspired by each other. It's like we were feeding off of each other's energy because everybody came in with such love for Swami. And, you know, there were some conversations that we had where we asked each other about how we felt when we heard the news. Everybody would only refer to how did you feel on April 24th? Where were you on April 24th? You know, they, they wouldn't talk about what happened on April 24th. They would just make references to the date. And there were some, you know, emotional conversations that we shared. But I would say all the young adults that I spoke with, everybody said, you know, for us, Swami is alive in our hearts. And he will always be alive in our hearts. And this life is truly for him. So just hearing that from, you know, your fellow young adults, it was just so inspiring. Um, just so very inspiring. Uh, the conference was on 13th and 14th. And um, 15th was Guru Purnima. And they had unveiled the Mahasamadhi. And um, there was a very beautiful cultural uh, program in the evening. And um, there were two singers, um, just an interesting event that happened. During the uh, session where the second singer was singing, I was inside the Kulwant Hall, so I didn't observe this phenomena, but I saw pictures of it. Some of the youth were, some of the youth were actually seated outside. They were not inside the Kulwant Hall. And they said when the second singer, he is a Sufi singer, so he's a mystic. When he, when he was singing, he was just, um, 
Swami became, the energy became so much more alive. And when he was singing his song, apparently, and it was a clear sky, it was not even raining, it was a clear blue sky, right above the Purna Chandra Auditorium and the Yajur Mandir, not one, not two, three rainbows appeared simultaneously. It's a clear blue sky, there's no rain, three rainbows appeared and all these young adults saw that and they went, Swami is here. Swami is here. Wherever you go, Swami is there with you. There's, there's no doubt at all. No doubt at all. Swami is very much alive in your hearts. So I met um, the young adult um, coordinator, the national coordinator from Mexico, Perla. Both of us were chatting a little bit um, one evening and she was sharing that um, they had a conference recently during the Holy Week of Easter and she said that they were all together uh, when they got the news about uh, Swami's, I call it the transition from his physical form to his omnipresent form. Uh, the conference there, when they had the conference, it was attended by more than 500 young adults. They were all together for that weekend, for the holy weekend, Easter weekend. And they are coming up with a lot of different service projects and uh, programs. And she said it was just incredible. They were so happy that they were all together when they received the news. And uh, they had a whole day of just prayer session and experience sharing session. And she was saying that, you know, there are so many activities that is happening, not only in Mexico, but even Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, Brazil, Argentina. We had young adults come um, from a lot of uh, South American countries. And, you know, some of the projects that they are doing is incredible. Most of it is education oriented. They go and um, teach human values in the school. Interestingly, most of the young adult projects are uh, education oriented, where young adults are working with the youth, disadvantaged youth or children. In Malaysia, they have a program, a very special program called the STAR program. So the young adults go to schools, especially high schools, and um, they have developed a buddy system where they pair up with a, um, a teenager who is, um, you know, who needs additional motivation just to get through to school or because they come from disadvantaged backgrounds. So the youth programs in Malaysia, in South America, in Mexico, they're all very focused on um, education in the community especially. In um, Russia, I, recent, I heard that they have started a program where they, <coughs> excuse me, they have started a leadership training program where all the young adult leaders go through a mandatory leadership workshop where they're trained. Um, it's not only just, you know, public speaking skills or write a good email um, or time management, but, you know, the foundation is, of course, Swami's teaching how, you know, you first learn to master your own self before you be a leader out there in the community. So some of those projects were, you know, very, very inspiring, very good work that's being done. We had, um, I spoke with a few young adults who came from Japan, and, you know, we asked them how the country is doing, especially after the most recent tsunami. They said it was mostly the eastern, um, coast eastern part of Japan that was significantly affected, not so much Tokyo, but almost every weekend, um, Japanese devotee and Japanese youth uh, prepare food packets and they make the trip to the eastern um, part of Japan where people have been significantly affected by the tsunami and they're doing Narayan Seva and they're also trying to come up with a project where they'll help rebuild the homes again. So that's something that they're considering on a long-term basis. So just to give you a few examples. You know, uh, we are so very fortunate here. The adults want us. The adults, the organization, 
um, this is um, you know I'm, I feel very uh, very grateful and very proud to share this because this didn't seem to be the experience in some of the other countries that there's such a beautiful integration of the adult organization and the young adults where um, you know the previous regional officers Dr. Congleton, um, Dr. Das and even now Dr. Das you know they are uh, they are our biggest cheerleaders every single project that the organization does the young adults are there if you take the medical camps you know the TFLs there are young adults um, the Satisai free clinic 50% of the volunteers every week are young adults. The Ability First project that's uh, coming up next week, for the past seven years, <coughs> excuse me, for the past seven years, the young adults have been um, co-leading the project and last year and this year, the young adults have been given an opportunity to lead the project, the Ability First project. So, you know, that kind of confidence that the adults have in us it helps us tremendously just to step up to the plate. Because there, we are so actively involved in the organization, there is very little time for us to do things on our own. Because the organization, you know, they kind of make us feel like we are supporting the organization with our energy and enthusiasm. So, the Samadhi Darshan is right after the morning bhajans and evening bhajans. And, um, you know, people form a line. You can walk up all the way till the Samadhi. You can touch the Samadhi. You can do Namaskar at the Samadhi. Depending on the crowd, you know, um, if there are a lot of people, you're not able to stay there longer. But if the crowd is less, they do allow people to stand there and pray a little bit and then they ask you to move. But they allow you to go all the way to the Samadhi. I saw a few people even bring flowers and place flowers at the Samadhi. Um, you mean projects, education? You know, um, I'll, I'll share with you what you know because I'm not involved with the educational wing. I believe last year or the year before, Swami blessed the institute, the education institute, Satisai Educational Institute, to be opened in the United States. And Hyman Johnson, who actually is from a region, he is the central coordinator for the Educational Institute. And I believe in June, they had a training session, a one-week training program for um, devotees who are already um, teachers. So um, that is their pilot training session. And they are hoping that once, <coughs> excuse me, once these devotees are trained, then hopefully in six months to a year, I'm not sure about the timeline, they would open it up to other devotees who are interested in, um, you know, teaching human values in the community. You know, interestingly, I got the news from Nicole. She was the one who called me. Um, I was eating dinner and I was in two minds, should I answer the call or not? Then I thought, Nicole generally doesn't call me at this time, I better answer the call. And I answered and she told me and I actually didn't believe it. And I said, well, let me double check and I'll get back to you. And um, I actually felt very numb. Uh, I, I didn't know how to react to it at all. I felt very numb and I kept getting a lot of phone calls from young adults. So I was on the phone throughout the night, all the way till the morning, um, just speaking with a lot of young adults. So I didn't have much time to be aware of my own feelings. I just felt really numb. and. It happened, we got the news Saturday night. Tuesday morning, um, when I was driving to work, 
Um, I, I was, you know, I have this, I drive a lot for my work, so I have the best time to have conversations with Swami um, instead of getting road rage. So it was Tuesday morning around 6, 10, 6, 15. I was driving to work. I was on my way to Covina and, you know, I've been on this freeway every single day for the past 10 years. And just to give you a little bit background, in January when I became the National Young Adult Coordinator, um, it was a Tuesday again, around 5.45, 6 in the morning. Um, as I was transitioning, you know, the 10, the 5 breaks it up a little bit by downtown. You get on to 5 and then you get back on to 10 by White Memorial Hospital. So I was on that section and, you know, I was having this conversation with Swami and I told, you know, I have this picture. We all have a picture of Swami in our cars. I was telling him, Swami, I, I talk to you all the time, like, you know, I'm yapping away. How come you never talk to me? Like, you know, wouldn't it be great if you talk to me once in a while? So I'm saying this out loud in the car, in this beautiful, gorgeous, white Mercedes Benz zooms past me. And the license plate says, think about it. I mean, the coordination. Six o'clock in the morning, Tuesday morning, um, in a city of one million people and two million cars. Somebody's having this conversation. They're telling a god who she thinks lives in India. And she's saying, I talk to you all the time. Why are you not talking to me? And guess what the license plate read? I talking to you. This was in January, right? So the way it's spelt is it's seven, right? Um, a license plate in California, they can be only seven letters. I, T, K, N, two, number two, U, alphabet U. I talking to you, T, K, N, G, to you, seven. So this happened in January. So I was like, oh, nice. You're talking to me through a license plate. Why don't you change your, you know, your medium of giving messages to me. But it was still sweet. It was very sweet and it reinforced a very powerful message that, you know, how can somebody hear you unless they are within you, right? How can somebody hear your own thoughts unless they are, if I'm saying something and you're able to hear me, that's because of the physical distance, right? You're able to hear me. If you're standing out on the street, probably if I don't have the microphone, you won't be able to hear me. So if somebody is able to hear me, that means he's really with me. So 24th was Sunday, 25th, 26th, April 26th morning, Tuesday. I was telling Swami, Swami, five months ago, I asked you, I told you that I talk to you all the time. Why are you not talking to me? And today, I'm not going to ask you why you're not talking to me, but I'm just going to thank you for talking to me. Guess what? I saw the same car again. I saw the same car again. He's here. He's right in your hearts. He has not gone anywhere. He's alive in you. He's alive in you. To answer the last part of your question, when I was seated in the Kulwant Hall, I remembered, even, even now, if I close my eyes, I can smell Puttaparthi because the, the connection is just so strong. When I was seated in the Kulwant Hall, I was remembering every single day because Swami had told us the best way you can express your gratitude to God is to remember your experiences with Him. You have to relive those experiences. That's the best way you can express your gratitude. So I was remembering and I was thinking, um, 
it, it, it did not feel empty because you know you, um, you, you felt the energy that was very alive. It was very, very strange that I was sitting there and I was remembering all those days when as a student I would sit there and we would complain a little bit saying, Swami, you're running late, like why don't you come out of the mandir and give us darshan? Or I would sit there and say, I don't want barfi today, it's boring, you gave it yesterday, can I have laddu for a change? I was sitting there and remembering all those experiences and I was surprised that when I reflected on that waiting that we did, that anticipation that we had, now when I look back, that experience seems so sweet. To wait for God to come, it is so sweet. And I wish I realized how sweet it is to wait for God and to feel that joy when you finally see Him. I wish I realized the way I realize it now. I wish I realized the sweetness a long time ago. I've, I've only heard that, you know, um, Swami has said that the time interval would be much less, it will be actually be immediate. But I've not heard it firsthand. So I don't want to, you know, give wrong information. But I also feel at the same time that he chose me to come to him when he wanted me to come to him with Swami. So with Premasai, I feel like when he wills, um, we'll all be there if we are meant to be there. Sairam. Thank you. Sairam. Sairam. Thank you.